right. Well, good morning. Again, we are here. It's Father's Day 2021 at the Olathe, Kansas Prairie Center Church got a prophecy. And so we, we want to start out with a dad joke today. Uh, so who is the, um, the shortest character in the Bible? Now, many of you would say Zacchaeus because he was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. Uh, but that's not true. It's actually somebody that is so short that they actually named him Nehi Amaya. <laughs> <laughs> Nehi Amaya. That's what we're going to study today. As we're doing this series of lessons on prayer, um, we want to study the uh, book or the, the, the events and the prayer associated with Nehemiah, okay? And that's where we're going to start off today. Our golden text scripture comes from 2 Chronicles 7.14. It says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. That's from 2 Chronicles 7.14. Uh, there's a lot of responsibility in there for us, isn't it? Uh, we need to, to, to uh, humble ourselves. We are God's people, aren't we? Yes. Okay. We are God's people. And that says, my people that are called by my name, we are God's people. Okay. We need to humble ourselves. We need to pray. We need to seek God's face. And in other words, seek uh, a, an intimate relationship with him. We need to turn from our wicked ways. Um, and if you say, well, I don't have any wicked ways. Well, you're wrong. You do have some <laughs> wicked ways. Okay. Um, you may not be as wicked as the, ne in the next guy, but you still have some, some improvements that we can do. But we need to make sure that we stay on the straight and narrow. So turn from our wicked ways. Then we'll, uh, we hear from heaven. The God will answer our prayers and will heal us. Um, and so today we are going to talk about a prayer for restoration. Prayer is essential for spiritual awakening. As we go through our lives, you know, we, we study so many of these lessons in the Old Testament, and we say, well, how does that apply to me? This was an event, uh, you know, kind of like Star Wars in a, in a galaxy far, far away in a time, a long time ago. Uh, but it's amazing how people are the same. Our problems are the same. The enemy's attacks against us are the same. You know, the locations may change, the technology may change, but the, the underlying uh, spiritual battles are the same. And so we want to, to study about that. Um, as we know, the children of Israel had gone through lots of peaks and valleys. They had, uh, you know, started off, God had blessed them. They were in uh, Egypt where the, the family origins had been saved from a famine. Uh, but over the, the next 400 years, they had fallen into uh, uh, slavery in Egypt and bondage there. And, uh, you know, of course, that uh, as we study the Old Testament, we come to understand that that bondage in Egypt reps, represents our spiritual bondage that we are born into in our natural lives here. Um, and so God provided a, a, a savior for them in a physical sense in the person of Moses, and he led them through the, the wilderness and all the trials and tribulations there. Uh, God provided Provided us a spiritual savior in the person of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made. But even in our uh, interim period here, as we uh, go through our wilderness area, our troubles and tribulations, as we await our entrance into the promised land, uh, we, we need to, to realize what uh, God has for us. And so the children of Israel had, had received their promised land. They had uh, gone into um, that area, but then they had begun to fall away. They had begun to uh, worship the idols of the local people. They had begun to um, uh, not perform the sacrifices in the right way that God had commanded them. Uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, where God gave all the, the laws to Moses and all the instructions to him, he repeatedly told them, if you do what I say, I will bless you. If you don't do what I say, and if you fall away from me, then you are going to be punished. You are going to be uh, given into bondage uh, once again. You had come out of bondage, and you celebrated that, but if you don't uh, follow my 
conditions, then you will be put uh, or you will fall back into bondage. And so from a spiritual sense, we have to believe that too. We are freed from the bondage of sin, but if we don't follow God's commands, if we fall away from the instructions that he has given us, we are at risk of falling back into bondage of, of the sin that's in this world. So that's what we want to be aware of. And so the, the book of Nehemiah is in the Old Testament. It's right after Ezra and right uh, before Psalms and, and Job and those areas. So if you're uh, not real familiar with your Old Testament, uh, that's where it's located. Or if you have your Bible uh, on the phone or something electronic, it's spelled N-E-H. That's how you start. And after that, it'll probably find it for you. So let's uh, read just a, a few scriptures here. Um, the uh, events here is that the children of Israel, uh, Israel had been conquered by the Babylonians, then the Babylonians had been taken over by the Persians, and there was a king, uh, Artaxerxes, that was in uh, rule at this time. And uh, we're, we're going to learn about uh, his uh, uh cup bearer named Nehemiah. And that's where verse 1 says, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hachaliah. And it came to pass in the month of Chislu, in the 20th year, I was in Shushan, the palace. So that gives us a lot of details there. It gives us a, this is an autobiographical, this is a memoir, you might say, of Nehemiah. And it starts off telling us who he was the son of, and who he, or where he was, and when it was. And so he was in the, the palace of Shushan, which is in a town, this was the winter palace for the Persian emperor at that time. It, it would be in what is modern day uh, Iran, in the southern part of Iran, so it would have been kind of a Mediterranean tropical type climate, climate there, you might say, uh, just above the Mediterranean Sea. So that's where they were. This would have been in, in the month that's important because that was would have been like mid-November to December time frame. So it was in the winter time and uh, they were in the palace and uh, here's what's going on next. Uh, it doesn't tell us where Nehemiah came from. He was born most likely into bondage here in Persia, but he was uh, he was a Jew. He was, we'll find that out later. Uh, it says it says that uh, uh, Han and I, one of my brethren, came. Uh, and when it says one of my brethren, that could have been his physical brother. It could have been that the word brother that's used in here in the Hebrew could have been a distant relative, or it could have been just his Hebrew brother. It could, you know it, that that part of the story is not critical for this. It was just it was somebody that he was closely related to. Uh, the the uh, at this time in history they had been in bondage, but there had been segments of the remnant of, of Israel that had been allowed to go back and start rebuilding Jerusalem. And so that's that's kind of the historical setting let's say the word with me, context. That's the context of what we're talking about. They were beginning to rebuild the uh, city of Jerusalem. And uh, did you happen to notice, I picked up on it last week, that Drew last week in his message, he used the word context. So he wasn't in our lesson, but I'm sure that I rubbed off on him someplace. <laughs> he did a wonderful job. But uh, they, so there, was, there were people that were building and attempting to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. They were trying to rebuild the temple. They were trying to rebuild the walls. They were trying to set up protection and economy and all of these things as God began to bless them and fulfill his promise to return them to their, their promised land after this uh, time of, uh, of uh, bondage. Okay, And so it says, Then Han and I, my brother, one of my brethren came, and he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, or those ones that had been um, allowed to go back to Jerusalem. Uh, uh, says, which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. He says, I want to know about Jerusalem. This was their spiritual hub. This was everything in their, in their uh, uh, Israelite mentality was Jerusalem. Everything was about Jerusalem. That's where they, they understood God's, that's where God visited them. That's where they worshiped God. Everything about their, their uh, feast and their celebrations and their praises were all centered around Jerusalem. So it was important for them to go back to that area. It says, um, 
And they said to me, I asked them, you know, how's, how's it going back in Jerusalem? These men had been traveling back and forth, evidently. It says, and they said to me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. And the wall of, Jer uh, of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. So he said, you know, it's not good news. Have you ever had bad news? We've all had bad news, isn't, haven't you? Some of us more recently than others. If you haven't had bad news recently, you'll get bad news in the future. I'm sorry to say that, but you will. Okay. So what do we do? What do we do in that situation? Um, the um, uh, this is what Nehemiah did. Now it's it's important for us to understand who Nehemiah was, or more importantly, who he wasn't. Okay. Um, it doesn't say anything about him being a priest. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't uh, a man of any stature uh, politically. Um, he was, as we'll learn throughout the story today, he was the king's cupbearer. Basically, that meant uh, you get to taste everything the king eats before the king eats it, and if you die, the king won't eat it. Okay. So every day, you know, the, the, we have to understand that the the, um, the culture around there. You know, the, the the kings were in constant risk of their life. You know, I, I suppose that's not even that unusual for today's time. You know, the 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 president, our our political leader, has extreme protection around him all the time. Uh, I'm not sure that he has a literal cupbearer or taster that that's tasting his food. But but this man Nehemiah was every day he was in the presence of the king. Every day he was there um, ministering to him in some way or another. And so they, there was some relationship there with him. So when he hears that his brethren, his homeland is in disrepair and that they are um, not able to protect themselves. They are not able to provide for themselves. They're, they're a reproach. They're, everything is going bad for the people that are trying to rebuild Jerusalem. There were political enemies around them. There were spiritual enemies around them trying to prohibit them uh, as the enemy does with us. Every time we try to do something good, the enemy comes against us. You know, uh, you try to, to, to do something for somebody and something will go wrong. Okay. I did that one year, and I've told the story before, but I was headed to the, with the family, we, a road trip out to Colorado. We had the, all the coolers packed with all kinds of cookies and goodies and sandwiches and stuff, and we were going out camping for a few days. Well, we get to a rest stop, and there was a family that was in distress. You know, They needed something. We didn't have any money to give them, um, we, but we had some food. So we gave them some food and some cookies. I, well, you know, we've, we've done a good thing here. We get back on the highway, and this thundercloud broke up. You could see blue sky on that side. You could see blue sky on that side all around. It was like the, the old you know, cartoon when the cloud is right over. So we tried to do something good, and something terrible is happening, and it just poured and poured and poured on us. And I said, well, yeah, we just, I just had to laugh about it, you know, because when you try to do something good, the enemy's going to try to discourage you. Um, and so that's what was happening here. He was trying to get to search. So what do we do about it? That's, that's the point. There was a need in Jerusalem, and Nehemiah was not uh, politically um, inclined. He was just a, a servant in a, in a foreign land. He was a servant of an oppressive uh, leader, Artaxerxes, if I didn't say that already. And that's where he was. Uh, so what did he do? He says, and it came to pass in verse four, when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the Lord or before the God of heaven. He says, I just, I sit down and cry. Do you ever have days when you just want to sit down and cry? Okay. He cried, he wept, he mourned. His heart ached for his kindred uh, in Jerusalem, for the city of Jerusalem. And, and really, as we said, it, it's not about the city as much as it is the, what the city I, is identified as, is the presence and the power of God. So he longed for the presence of God to be reestablished, for the, com the communication uh, with God to be reestablished, for the blessings of God to be reinstated. And so that's what he was longing for. So he did what he could do. He began to, to weep and cry, but then he fasted. He prayed. It was a time, you know, even in the New Testament when the, the miracles were happening or the, the disciples 
miracles at some point, you know, th there was a lack of miracles. And they said, why is that not happening? And, and the instruction was, those things come about by prayer and fasting. There, there's no uh, other way. There, there's only one way to God, and we know that's through Jesus Christ. If we want the power of God in our life, it comes through prayer and fasting. That, that's a, a way of, of uh, communing with God in, in our daily walk. Okay? Um, and he began the prayer. Of course, that's what our lesson is all about today, is the prayer that he prayed. And so he, he uh, starts that in verse 5, and, and uh, he describes, again, this is a memoir. He's talking about himself. He says, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Uh, just and we'll study the uh, Lord's Prayer next week, but uh, that that pattern is evident in a lot of prayers that we see in the Scriptures. The first thing we need to do when we start approaching God is recognize who God is. He's the God of heaven. And that means that He is all uh, has all authority. He is the Creator of all things. All of those things that that are associated with being the Lord or the Master of heaven. Uh, he's great and terrible. Not not terrible in a bad way, but terrible in a in an awesome way. He's just He's he's above all things. There's nothing like him, and, and recognizing that, and and understanding that um, uh, you know he is able to do all things for us. And then if uh, you know, as we go through, and I do this, and I think I've heard other people do it too. You start talking about God's promises to us. Okay, why do we do that? Do we need to remind God what His promise was? God, you promised you'd do that. That sounds like a whiny little child. <laughs> you promised we'd get a pony. And we didn't get a pony, okay, or something like that. I'm just just grabbing one out of the air, you know. Um, but we, 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 that's not why we're talking to God. We don't. God didn't forget that He had made promises to us. God didn't forget. Oh yeah, I forgot. I created the universe, and I'm responsible for these people that I created. He doesn't forget that. But he, what it does is it reminds us who God is. When we say something, it reminds us who we're, we're putting ourselves in the proper position to, uh, to understand who God is and what he has promised us. And so that's what he goes on. He says, let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open. He's, you know, God's not uh, deaf or blind to what we're going through, but he likes to hear about it. Okay, he likes to to, to talk about it, um, you know, and, and he goes on talking about um, how they are um, uh, sinful. He says uh, they're going to confess their sins. He says which we have sinned against thee. He says both I and my father's house have sinned. He says, you know what, I I am a sinner, and that's the the way we can go before God. You know, if we go before God, and say, well, God, I've done a lot for you. You know, you ought to really be happy to have a person like me on your side. I don't know how you get things done if it wasn't for me. No, that's that's not the way Nehemiah, because he didn't have anything. He wasn't doing anything important. He wasn't an important person. But he knew that he could pray to God and that God had the authority to, to uh, uh, fulfill the need that they had. And so um, he goes on, he says, uh, verse 7, these are the sins that they have done. He says, we have dealt corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. He says, you know, we, we're, we've done a lot of bad things and, and we deserve to be punished, but God, you are merciful. And that's the same thing we pray in our lives today. God, I am a sinner but you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to, to, to forgive me for that. And, and if I come and confess those sins to you, you'll be merciful and you will forgive those things. And that's that's what we want to make sure we understand and remember as well. Um, but he, he, he says... Uh, uh, in verse 8, he says, Remember, I beseech thee, or I beg ye, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. And that's what had happened. They had disobeyed God. He had scattered them. He had uh, uh, allowed them to be overrun and taken into bondage. He says, But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out into the uttermost part of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence, and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. He says, I will bring them back. I will offer forgiveness and restoration. Uh, and that's what he uh, continues to pray for in verse 11. He says, O Lord, again, I beseech thee, or I beg of you, God, 
Uh, he says, let now thy ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants. So he wasn't just praying by himself. There were others praying. Remember that group of people? He says, I, I talked to my brother and other of my brothers from Judah. He says, uh, we had gathered together. We, had, we were in agreement uh, in our prayers for the, the restitution or the, 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 um, um, the restoration of Jerusalem. He says, we, we continue to pray for that. We continue to seek that. He says, I want you to, to grant that. Uh, but then he has a, a, a plan. He says, I want you to... Uh, the servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper, uh, I pray thee, thy servant this day. So he says that we, we, want to, um, we want to come to a renewed understanding of who you are, God. And he says, I want you to help me prosper in what we're about to do. He says that I'm going to, to uh, uh, I want you to, to give me this. He says, thy servant this day and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. That's where we get the, the clue as to what he was and where he was in the king's uh, 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 palace there, that he was the cupbearer. He was a servant of the king. He says, I'm, I'm going to do something before the king. Uh, and he says, I want you to help me. I want you to help me prosper or be successful in what we're doing in seeking. So he began to plan. You know what? That, that's a part of our walk with Christ. If we are looking to, to uh, um, be successful in our Christian walk, we need to pray. If there's a problem that, that it has arisen, if we need to, to be restored, we need to start praying. We need to start fasting. But we also need to start planning. You know, what, what do you want me to do, God? You know, and, and we need to start looking for opportunities uh, to do that. So he had, um, he had no particular position of authority, but he was in a position to be uh, effective here with God's help. So he, he asked for God's blessing. Uh, verse uh, 1 of chapter 2, it says, And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, or Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king. So again, it gives us some context of where we are. This was three or four months later. Okay, well, He had been praying. He had been seeking God. He had been fasting. Okay? It, it, it won't always happen overnight. God's answer to our prayers won't always come in the time we expect it. But he continued to, to seek God. He continued to do his job. Uh, but he was there. And it says, uh, uh, it says, I was taking the, the wine before him, and I took the wine and gave it unto the king. It says, and now I had not been before time sad in his presence. When, when you were serving the king, you had to at least pretend like you were happy. You know, oh, I'm, I'm happy to do this, yay. No, he, he was uh, living a life um, that was uh, pleasing or attempting to please God, and, and he was doing work according to God's principles. And, and uh, the, the scriptures tell us, and you know, if we're doing a job, do it as if we're doing it unto the Lord. Okay, so he was fulfilling his responsibility. We see lots of other uh, godly men and women throughout the Bible that, when they were doing their work, even if it was for an evil king, if they were doing it with godly morals and godly principles, the, they were recognized for that. There was, a, there was something different about their countenance. There was something different about their personality. This is just a little side nugget for you. If you're working in a job and, and you're not able to present yourself with godly principles and godly character and godly um, uh, peace and joy, then, then you may not be doing it right. Okay, and so it should be recognized in you by by your employer, and that's what it was. He says I had had always been doing a good job before the king, but in verse two it says, "Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart." Then was I sore afraid. He says I. <laughs> Uh, it showed on his face that he had something heavy on his heart, and the king recognized that, and the king sought out. Now, he had been praying for this. He had been praying, Lord, help me to, to, to use my position, even though it's not a lofty position, I have access to the king. Help me to use that position to, to accomplish something for your good. 
Um, and that's where he was. He had a passion for it. Uh, he had the he was in the right position for it. And then the the response uh, finally comes uh, a few months later. So he was he was afraid. He was concerned. You know, if the king didn't like him being sad around him, the king says, "You're bringing me down. I'm going to eliminate you." You know, that was within the king's authority, and and was probably something that he would do. Um, but he says, "This is what I want." He, he, he gave the king his uh, blessing. He said to the king, let the king live forever. That's a common phrase of, you know, you know it's not you, it's me. You know, it's, uh, it's nothing you've done, king. You're, you're the man I work for, and you're, and you're doing uh, things, uh, not that you're doing right, but he says it, it's not about you. It's something that's on me. He says, the place where my fathers, my ancestors are buried, the, the heritage of my family, the, the godly um, uh, influence that I'm looking for in my life is um, not uh, in good repair. They are oppressed and they are not, uh, uh, they're not able to protect themselves. All of these things that he had uh, uh, expressed to him. It says in verse 4, it says, Then the king said unto me, um, For what dost thou make request? It says, okay, now you're in the right position. You've prayed about it. You've done some planning. And then somebody asks, well, okay, what are you going to do about it? What do, you want, what do you want me to do about it? And that's exactly what is this, Cindy? You, you couldn't hear that, but she says, uh, you know, we, when we have an opportunity, we see an opportunity, God gives us an opportunity, then what are you going to do when he fulfills that request? And so he did what uh, any wise person would do. He says, so I prayed to the God of heaven. He says, now he was still in the presence of the king. Uh, it doesn't give us a time frame there. Have you ever said one of those quick, silent prayers? Lord, I need you right now. You know, Lord, uh, you know, you've prepared your heart ahead of time, but sometimes things happen suddenly. You know, he had no idea that this was going to be the day that the king recognized his sadness. He was not, he was not prepared ahead of time. You know, if we have, well, if, uh, king, if I had a week's notice, I could come up with a list of things. Okay. Oh, I could, I could do things right if I had a little time. But the king says, what do you want me to do about it? And so he, he said a quick prayer to God. And then he said to the king, it says, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, and thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. He says, I, I want to go back and, and build my city back up. I want to, again, we're, we're, we're talking about a physical city, but it, it's representing that uh, fellowship with God, that relationship with God that they were seeking to renew in, in their lives there. And so that was what the um, uh, Nehemiah says to the king. He says, if, if you're happy with it, he says, I'm going to, I want to go do that. You know, that means that the king is going to have to train a new cupbearer. The king is going to have to have somebody else come in for a period of time. Um, and the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, for how long shall thy journey be and when will thou return? He says, okay, he says, we, we can do this, but for how long? You know, and, and Nehemiah was going, well, I, you know, in, in my mind, I, it wanted to be forever. You know, I wanted to go back and, you know, I wanted to live in Jerusalem. He was still suffering in the captivity uh, of the people in, in Persia there. He was still struggling there, but, but he was granted a blessing uh, through his prayer to God and through his uh, favor that he found because of his godly work for the king. He found favor with that king, and it, it implies here the queen also, okay? The queen was sitting by him. So the king and the queen were both there, um, and again, they, 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 this was a man that they probably saw several times a day and had um, a, a, a relationship with of some sort. It says, how long are you going to be gone, and what do you need? It says, and so it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. I said, I'm going to go do it for this period of time, and then I'll come back. And, and as, as you study through the story, it was. He, he went for several years, and he, he built the, helped build the city, and they had a celebration, and then he came back and fulfilled his responsibility to what he, he was doing. Um, it says, um, uh, it says, moreover, 
Now, this is where I think it takes a little boldness, okay? When we're in a situation here where Nehemiah was uh, a servant, a lowly servant, he has just asked the king an extraordinary uh, request. You know, I want to be gone for, it doesn't say what the time was there, but we know it was several years. I want to be gone for several years, and then I'll come back. He says, but I also need some other stuff. He says, he says, I want you to do this. He says, I want you to, in verse 7, says, Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given to me to the governors beyond the river, that they may conv convey me over till I come unto Judah. He says, it's, it's going to be a dangerous journey. He says, I want your protection. I want a letter of protection. The, the king's word, the king's uh, recommendation for him or authorization for him was, you know, a, a free pass. You know, he, he could go anywhere and, and, and would have the protection of the king's guard and the king's authority during his travels uh, to that. Uh, he says, and, he says, not just that. It says, I want a, a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he, may, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, uh, which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. He says, you know, I don't just want permission to leave. I want your protection, and I want you to supply my needs and not just my needs, but the needs of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, the city of Jerusalem was was under um, the, the Persian uh, Empire's control. They had the authority to do whatever they wanted to there. But, you know, and, and we see f from a lot of history that the king's forest was the king's property. You know, you, you, you look back at, you know, stories like Robin Hood when they, you know, if you if you killed a deer in the king's forest, you could be executed for that. You know, the, the king's domain was something that was critical. And not only did this um, uh, foreign king, this, this king that was not a godly man, not only did he bless Nehemiah with permission, he gave him protection, and out of his own uh, forest, he supplied the timbers to rebuild the city gates. He supplied the timbers to build Nehemiah's own house. Uh, and and the, and the t and the temple as they begin to build it as well. All of the needs that they had, God supplied with with somebody, uh, and it was all based on uh, the uh, the prayer that Nehemiah had requested and had sought God for. And so, we, as we look at the the summary of this lesson, okay, what does it call us to do today? Okay. We need to um, live our lives. You know, we, we may not be in a prominent position right now. We may not be in a situation where we are doing anything other than just doing our daily walk with God and doing our work for our family and our job. We're just we're living the life that we know how to live, and that's what Nehemiah was doing. Okay, suddenly he saw a need that needed to be fulfilled. He saw uh, some people that were in distress. He had compassion on those people. It said he, he sat down and he wept and he cried and he prayed. Okay, When's the last time your heart was touched by the needs of somebody else besides yourself? When's the last time that you sat down and wept for somebody uh, because of the needs, the compassion, the godly compassion that's in our heart? Okay, So he didn't stop there. He didn't stop with just the weeping. The weeping is is a is a part of our response when we see somebody that's in uh, a, a, a needy situation. But he he not only wept, but then he prayed. He fasted. He sought God. He sought uh, inf uh, instruction from God. He sought sought direction from God. And so he he sought for guidance. He sought for provision. He began to plan. Like I said, he, he, he knew what he needed. God had blessed him with, with the understanding of what he needed to ask for and, and put him in a position uh, to do that. He used his position of uh, this relationship that he had with the king. God may have you in a position right now where you have a relation with somebody. It may not be somebody that's a particularly godly person, but that person may still be able to fulfill a need that God has put on your heart that you have prayed for. And so he used his influence for God's glory, and then he did it. He acted, he put it into action. He put his, his sadness 
uh, that he started with. He put that into to an action towards God, but then he, he physically uh, uh, did the work. Okay? He was in a very comfortable position. Other than that daily risk of being poisoned, uh, he was having a pretty good life. He, he got to go to the south in the, in the winter and uh, probably someplace cool in the summertime. He was, wherever the king was, he was there. Okay? So he had a, a comfortable life, but it wasn't what God wanted him to do. God had a mission for him, even though he didn't know it. He wasn't uh, in any uh, uh, lofty position, but he acted in response to God's uh, uh, pull on his life. And so that's what I want us to do today. You know, use the position you're in, the compassion that God gives you, seek God's face and, and stand on his promises. We didn't go into a lot of detail on that, but throughout his prayer, as he's reciting God's promises, those are all scriptures that, that he had learned as a child. Uh, learning of God's promise to uh, restore, learning of God's promise to protect, learning of God's promises to, to offer provision, all of those things, understanding who God is. Those are all things that we uh, need to, to uh, uh, apply in our prayers to God as we seek a relationship with him and seek to fulfill a need uh, like Nehemiah did. And, and we know that, that uh, uh, you know, over time, this, this was successful and, and God's blessing, it didn't happen overnight, but God's blessing was fulfilled to him. The promises were fulfilled. So stand on the word of God. When we have word of, the word of God that says he will supply our every need, that he will stand by us, that he will offer us forgiveness, uh, for if we will come and ask him all of those promises that he has a, a, a paradise, a reward waiting that he has prepared for us, all of those promises are the word of God. And if we pray the word of God, we seek God's face, he will fulfill those. Uh, but it does require some action on our part as well. We need to, to follow his commandments and say true to what he has asked us to do. So thank you for being here today. God bless you and, and, and start that prayer and fasting right after lunch today. <laughs> thank you. God bless you.